In 2006, with seven undergraduate seniors at Middlebury College in Vermont, and no money or other resources except insight and courage, Bill McKibben became a principal founder of 350.org, the now illustrious international organization that has coordinated over 15,000 rallies in 189 countries since 2009, all to raise consciousness about the imminent dangers of climate change. Taking their name from the research of atmospheric scientist James Hansen, indicating the number of parts per million of CO2 that we could safely absorb into the atmosphere, Bill and his students wanted to organize globally. All over the world, he writes, people figured out what these numbers meant and went to work. Since the Earth's atmosphere now stands at over 400 parts per million of CO2 and 2015 was the hottest year on record, there's clearly more work to be done in resistance to the dangers of global warming. In addition to the achievements of 350.org, as distinguished Schumann scholar in environmental studies at Middlebury College, McKibben has written over a dozen books, beginning with The End of Nature in 1989, which is now available in more than 20 languages and widely regarded as one of the most important books on climate disruption and its human causes, through his latest title, Oil and Honey, The Education of an Unlikely Activist. Please join me in welcoming Bill McKibben to Portland, Maine by satellite from his home in Middlebury, Vermont. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. okay, yeah, give that a shot. Okay. I'm going to go climb one. Well, it is a great pleasure to get to join with you all, and I'm sorry for the technological difficulties here. Um, I'm, I'm apologize for the technological difficulties, and I wish I was there with you in person. Uh, Portland's one of my favorite places on the planet, but there's something to be said for all of us learning how to do these things in other ways that don't use much carbon, and so I'm glad to be um, working out the kinks with you tonight. I'll just talk for a few minutes because we're behind schedule, and I know you've got an amazing panel there of people with lots of old friends of mine, um, but I, I, I did want to say a few things. Um, today was a tough day. Today, we learned that um, one of the great uh, environmental activists, environmental justice activists in the world, Berta Kacheris in Honduras, was assassinated. Um, she's been working to stop big dam projects, and that's left her unpopular. Um, today, we learned that uh, in the course of the day, it was a historic day. It appears to be the first time in human history that the Northern Hemisphere was a full, taken as a whole, a full two degrees centigrade above the long-term planetary average. That is, that we're beginning to breach the um, temperature levels that we've been saying we're going to do everything we could to prevent. Um, we learned yesterday that the first official climate refugees in that state, an Indian tribe in Louisiana, are having to abandon their land because it's sinking beneath the water. And of course, we continue to talk morning after morning with our colleagues in Fiji, who just absorbed the, the worst hurricane in their part of the world ever, the highest wind speeds ever measured in the southern hemisphere. A uh, storm that wiped out about 10% of their GDP, i.e., in financial terms, did about 15 times the damage of Hurricane Katrina. So it's been a hard few days, which means that it's a real pleasure to get to join with you all and talk about the emerging movement and the emerging battle around climate change. That's the most widespread movement and fight probably in human history. Um, one of profound and preeminent reasons that we need to take on climate change and take it on so fast is because of its uh, effect on peace around the world. There is no way to have a peaceful planet that's being physically destabilized. And we can see that now almost everywhere. There was a series of new scientific papers that came out today 
uh, making clear that the drought in Syria that helped kick off the current conflict there was the deepest drought in at least 900 years and completely linked to the rapid increase in global average temperature. Uh, when that drought hit, people had to leave their farms and move into the city, and there was no way that the already fragile and authoritarian Assad government could cope with that. And so the chaos that resulted is what we see. And it spreads, obviously, around the world. But the same story happens over and over and over again in place after place. It's forced to take the funds that it would otherwise use for development, for peace, and instead spend them on horrible complications that come from warming the planet. Right now in our hemisphere, it's the rapid spread of the Zika virus on the wings of the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which in turn is spread up and down the hemisphere because of the rapid warming and the more intense humidity of the hot world that we're building. There are now five countries in our hemisphere where public health authorities have told women not to have children for the time being because of the potential damage. Around the world, people are building walls long before Donald Trump ever gets the opportunity. Uh, the Indians have built a 2,500-mile wall between them and Bangladesh because they know that the sea is rising rapidly and they know where the 200 million people in Bangladesh are going to try to go. And there's no vacant real estate in India for them to go to. Um, um, this is boring the world round, and it intensifies with each passing month as the temperature rises and conditions get more bleak. And of course, this will sharpen as as expected. The temperature rises another two, three, four degrees Celsius in the course of this century. The agronomist told us flat out that from this point on, each degree increase in global average temperature is going to cut grain yields about 10%. All of you know enough about world peace to know what will happen in a world that's two or three degrees warmer and with 20 or 30% fewer calories. That is absolute recipe for endless instability. And so it is incumbent upon us to try and stop this before it can get any worse. Uh, you watch the nations of the world come together in Paris and, and they actually made a certain amount of progress. The rhetoric that came out of the Paris Agreement was pretty good. World leaders committed the planet to trying to keep temperature increases to 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius at the worst, which would mean that we'd need to end the fossil fuel age now and go to renewable energy as fast as is humanly possible. This is a great emergency. The rhetoric was good. The actual plans put forward were less good. Uh, if you add up all the numbers, as the computer modelers quickly did, the pledges that the planet put forth at that great conference add up to a world that's about three and a half degrees Celsius warmer, a world where we can't have civilization of the kind that we're accustomed to. And that's why we need very badly to go to work, and the good news is that people are finally going to work. Paris came out better than the conference in Copenhagen some years earlier, precisely because there now is a giant movement in every corner of the planet. 400,000 people marched in New York City in the fall of 2014. Perhaps some of you were there. It was the biggest demonstration about anything in our country in a very long time. And as President Obama said at the UN six weeks later, when people march, we have to listen. No leader felt that they could come home from Paris empty-handed as they could from Copenhagen. It was a great vindication of the role of movements and of protest in forcing political action. But now we have to step up that action in order to hold those nations accountable to the promises that they made. So all over the world, people are doing just that. There's this giant divestment movement underway to put pressure on the fossil fuel industry. And increasingly, it's working. In many ways, it began there in vain. It's a 
raised command of Tiny Unity College in Maine to divest its small portfolio. And now it's now spread all over the world. And when we were in Paris, Leonardo DiCaprio announced that endowments and portfolios worth $3.4 trillion had agreed to begin divesting fossil fuels. That's a big deal. It's a big deal that we're able now to sometimes block new infrastructure projects, the Keystone Pipeline, or the great work that people in South Portland have done to stop the uh, pipeline they wanted to run down from Quebec uh, uh, um, to the Atlantic Ocean, or the amazing work that's going on place after place around the continent as the head of the American Natural Gas Association said last spring, we somehow have to stop the keystoneization of every pipeline that we're building. The same with coal ports, the same with frack wells. Every place that people are trying to extend the fossil fuel infrastructure, people are doing their best to shut them down. And increasingly, as with Shell in the Arctic last summer, they're winning. And many, many thanks to all of you who are engaged in that work. And We'll just need more and more of it. In May, we're doing this large uh, break free from fossil fuel day all over the planet, all kinds of groups coming together to do civil disobedience on the biggest carbon deposits around the planet, all the biggest coal mines and gas fields and things. The stuff that just literally has to stay in the ground. When we did this work even five or six years ago, we weren't completely clear what we were going to do instead to power our lives. We knew that this was not an option because it was going to wreck the world. Now, happily, we know what that alternative is. In the last eight years, the price of a solar panel dropped 80%. It means we're at a moment now when if we wanted to, this planet could extend electricity to every person on Earth, and it could do it in ways that didn't damage the planet. The fact that we're not doing it on the scale that we need to reflects mainly the power of the fossil fuel industry to block wind turbines and solar panels. In this country, people like Warren Buffett and the Koch brothers are succeeding in getting the utility commissions to make it all but impossible for people, even in the sunniest parts of the country, Arizona, Nevada, Florida, to put solar panels on their roof. They recognize what a dire threat to their business model they face. And so, uh, the fight is underway. It is a fight with real adversaries who behaved in reprehensible ways. We learned earlier this year, for instance, that ExxonMobil uh, knew everything there was to know about climate change 30 years ago. And instead of telling us, they, A, went to work climate-proofing their own facilities, raising their drilling rigs to account for this sea level rise they knew was coming. But B, spending tens of millions of dollars to build the architecture of deceit and denial and disinformation that kept us engaged in a pointless, phony argument about climate change for a quarter century. Had they merely said, you know what, our scientists say the same things as Jim Anson. Well, the debate would have ended in the early 1990s and we would have gotten to work and we'd be well on the way to solutions now. So now is the time to engage this battle, and it is a battle, peaceful, nonviolent, but very real battle, and to do it using all the tools that the 20th century taught us were at our disposal. The great technology, if you will, of the 20th century, the greatest technology wasn't nuclear vision, and it wasn't genetic uh, manipulation. It was the Gandhian discovery of nonviolence, a powerful tool to challenge power. And the subsequent development of that technology by people like Dr. King. Um, um, and it is very good to speak to people who are in that tradition and to say that this is the tradition we need now to be calling on more and more and more. Um, I helped organize at the beginning of the Keystone Pipeline protest what turned into the largest civil disobedience action about anything in this country in 30 years. And 
I'd written a letter asking people to go to jail, and, and I stood there after I got out myself, day after day after day, watching as 1,200 and some people um, marched off to jail, and it was very moving and very powerful. And one of the things that made it powerful was the spirit in which people went. When I'd written the letter asking people to come, one of the things I'd said was, I didn't think that young people should have to be the cannon fodder here. Um, they're doing most of the leading in this movement all over the world. But if you're 22, you know, a um, arrest record may not be the very best thing for your resume. Uh, once you've, one of the few um, unmixed blessings of growing older is that um, past a certain point, so what the hell are they going to do to you? you know? And so it was with great pleasure that we watched all kinds of people with hair like mine arriving in D.C. We did not ask people, how old are you? But we did, cleverly, I think, say who was president when you were born. <laughs> and the uh, two biggest cohorts were from the FDR and the Truman administrations. And that was good because, among other things, it let the young people who were there see elders acting the way elders need to act and they work in society. Um, that was very powerful. And, and we need much more of that. One of the sadnesses for me of this election season is watching the way that um, young people are again trying to lead in the right direction um, and, and, and other demographics, you know, older voters finding it so hard to follow their lead. Um, but we'll catch up someday. Um, other thing that was good about those arrests in Washington, from my point of view, was that we told everybody, if you want to get arrested, come wearing a necktie or dress. Not because I like formal wear, you can tell from looking at me. I mean, I'm a good Vermonter, I wear a necktie only when I go to funerals, you know? But um, we wanted to make the point that there was nothing radical in what we're asking for. Not when we ask for a peaceful world and not when we ask for a world whose temperature is something like the world that all our human ancestors experienced. Those aren't radical demands. In many ways, those are conservative demands. Radicals work at oil companies. If you're willing to get up in the morning and make your fortune by changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, if you're willing to do it once scientists have told you what would happen, if you're willing to do it once you've watched the Arctic melt and the ocean acidify, if you're willing to do that, then you're far more radical than anything anyone in the 60s ever dreamed about, you know? Uh, you're dangerous radical, and we need to figure out how to rein you in. And together, that's what people around the world are trying to do. I cannot guarantee you that we're going to win this fight because we start out well behind, and it's a fight with a time limit. But I can't. Every night, there's thousands of meetings like this all over the planet as people try to figure out how to come together and build the kind of currency of movements in large enough quantity to stand up to the cold, hard cash that the fossil fuel industry can lay on the table. That's our job, um, and it is such an honor to get to do it with you all and to say thank you for the work that you've done and the work that you will do. And I will look forward to, I guess, seeing you in jail. <laughs>